They're, well, I, they're, they're making them pay something. I can't even believe that. That is ultimately their plan. Their their ultimate plan is to get uh, the U.S. government to become socialized enough. While they decry socialism, they are getting the U.S. government to become socialized enough to be able to fund these plants completely out of taxpayers' pockets. Well, wait a minute. This is a strange... Speaking of hybrid reactors, so these guys are, are socialists in the back door and capitalists mm-hmm. in the front yes. door. Yes. They want to yes, say, we're capitalists, we're smart yeah. guys, we take risks, we make hard... Ch- we build things, and yet... We don't want to be connected with the consequences. We don't have enough faith in our own judgment and ability and efforts to even stand by the crap we build. We want, we want to leave it on your doorstep. So, Arnie, what would yeah, happen a, if, one yeah, of, if one of these plants went down? Like, what would happen if Vermont Yankee or, say, Palo Verde in Arizona, a three re, a three-unit reactor system went down with, with say, a plane hit? To the cooling tower rooms. Oh, well, or, or Palo Verde. I'm, a I'm sorry. To the uh, to the spent fuel pond r- r- rooms. Yeah, Palo Verde is a little different, but the Vermont Yankee. Um, uh, there's actually been a study by by Brookhaven National Laboratory. Certainly not a hotbed of nuclear anti nuclear activity. No. <laughs> um, but anyway, Brookhaven said that if the uh, fuel pool were to drain, you'd have a fire, and that's for sure. And the fire would release as much radiation as. Uh, every nuclear weapon that's ever been exploded in the atmosphere. Oh, my and, God. Uh, mm. And it would cause the permanent evacuation of a 40-mile radius circle, and it would cause uh, in excess of 100 million uh, cancers, 100,000 cancers, rather, I'm sorry. So it's, uh, and, and yet the NRC does not move the fuel out of the pools. Now, here's their argument the NRC is making. Well, if we move the fuel out of the pool, the workers are going to be more exposed. And so, therefore, we have to take into account worker exposure as we're moving the fuel. God, but that's, a, that's, that's the first time they've argument. ever cared about workers. Well, that's exactly Jesus. right. Jesus. Because when these plants were um, um, older, younger, uh, it used to take 90 days to move the fuel. And now utilities have gotten it down to where they can move it in 15, which increases worker exposure. Right. So right. where was the NRC when we were shuffling fuel fast? They were on the sidelines. But now that we want to move the fuel down and protect the public, the NRC is saying, oh, we got to worry about worker exposures. You know, Mr. Gunderson, just for my own edification, um, in terms of the history of nuclear power, uh, someone said to me that um, the reason it came into, an exi- into existence was to solve a problem that the, de- that the Pentagon or the Defense Department had around uh, weapons production. And so if that's the case, we're sort of, stumbling and not recovering our balance where we're making a set of bad decisions to solve a bad decision and then you know do this other set of bad decisions so if it wasn't really needed for power but they they sold it that way but they're really solving a problem for the weapons industry as as how to deal with a byproduct and now there there's all these you know how do you deal with the fuel rod so we're it's like band-aid over band-aid over band-aid it, no, I think you're right. The, the, um, we would not be using enriched uranium nuclear power plants were it not for the bomb program. Wow. Maybe that's, so that's true. Yeah. Maybe scientists uh, would have come up with a different design, but the design we have is driven because we had a bomb program. Wow. That's very wow. true. Um, and then, so if we were to have, say, some kind of problem like you were referring to, Arnie, with the Vermont plant, or say Palo Verde, perhaps, what what would be the damages? How long would that area be, you know, off limits? At least three hundred and possibly thousands of years. Um, it's it's an extraordinarily long amount of time, uh, because what happens when you have a fuel pool fire is hmm. you not only volatilize the cesium, which is a, a muscle seeker and, and and a bad actor, but you also volatilize the plutonium and Plutonium, named after Pluto, the god of hell, is is uh, is the nastiest element uh, out, out there. Um, can, can I touch on one thing? We were talking about socializing risk and and uh, certainly. Now, Arnie, no, we've got to go to break here in a minute. So, uh, if it's a big one, we'll, we'll we're going to have to finish it uh, in in the, in the next quarter when we come back. So, launch into it, but no, we might have to stop you. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, um, Florida is planning four new nukes. They will add nine percent to the capacity of the grid, but they will double the capital cost of all of the power plants in the state. What's that going to mean? That means that Floridians are going to pay double their electric rate. Now, we all know that won't happen, so what will happen is that the loan guarantees that these plants are going to be built under are going to shift that risk uh, you know, to Arizona or up to Vermont so that the Floridians don't have to pay the high electric for the plants that they're about to buy. You mean they're going to socialize the cost into the larger pool of the entire U.S. population as opposed to just the population of Florida? That's right. All right. We're going to break. We'll be back in a minute, 529-3508. Okay, we are back, talking about nuclear power, scales falling from our eyes, scales on the pipes. Yeah, hmm. Uh, Mr. Gunderson was talking about uh, externalizing both financial risks and also harm. Uh, Mr. Gunderson, wasn't there a, a, a one or maybe even two locations in Southern California where there were plants that were shut down that have really never been, uh, not never been, but hardly ever talked about where there's uh, high cancer rates that have been going on for generations? Well, the, the first major nuclear accident in the country was at uh, Santa Susana, which is outside of L.A. So everybody and thinks it was Three Mile Island, but that's not the case. It was worse than Three Mile Island. Worse than Three Mile Island? The government covered it up for 20 or 30 years. Wow. The, um, it was a it was a research reactor, and uh, the ground is still contaminated to this day. Um, and there's all sorts of associated cancers. Uh, scientists are just now beginning to realize how serious that accident was. What year? Um, what year did that happen? Russ, you remember for sure? Uh, I think it was fifty nine. Yeah, it was the late fifties. I know, but I, yeah, fifty nine is a good guess. It was about 40 miles outside of L.A., and, of course, back then, yeah. it was, um, you know, it was, it was shrubs. And it was boonies. Mm -hmm. But, of course, as people have moved in, no one's told them the soil is contaminated, and, um, and there are some meaningful... Uh, you mean it wasn't on the listing? <laughs> no. No, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Crap, Another Arnie. Disclosure. <laughs> So that that reactor, we've had a whole slew of mishaps too. I mean, we we've had a reactor in in uh, Ohio that um, the reactor vessel is 12 inches thick, steel of, of stainless steel, right? And and one there was a boric acid problem in one of the reactors in Ohio that came down to three sixteenths of an inch thick, and they said if that plant had gone on for six more months of operation, they probably would have had a full-scale meltdown. Now, you make me think of uh, something that was going on at San Onofre, where they, can you talk about how they remodel San Onofre, Arnie? Uh, there's a, um, uh, Farron's just put up a report an hour ago, uh, and Associated Press and some of the others are covering it today. Um, what happened was the San Onofre steam generators were uh, about 30 years old, and uh, needed to be replaced. So uh, they went out and, um, uh, and, and, and replaced them. And this is, used to be a matter of relative routine, except mm -hmm. that uh, the, the, the folks at uh, Southern California Edison really juiced this one up and added more tubes and took out structural supports, etc. So l let, me, let me say this a little bit differently for our listeners. They um, took out the, st when they took out the structural stuff, it weakened the safety in the design, but they wanted to do that to add more tubes so they could have more power, sell more electricity, and make more money. That's exactly right. And so... Well, and what happened was... Who approved that? It was stunning to me is that somebody other than an employee of that company had to approve that design, and even to an untutored person, that... Uh, flaw in the thinking in that design had to be evident. No one. And so, can you talk about were there objections raised? Did they? Who did people understand this going into this? Um, they, that's a great question. It, they they made a strategic decision that they wouldn't tell the NRC, and then they. W wait a minute. The, the PG is this PG and E? <laughs> no, this is Southern California Edison. Oh. They, there's a thing called fifty fifty nine 
Uh, and their first decision was, we're going to change the steam generators, and we're going to do it without amending the license. God, I can't and even build a tough shed without a permit. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> right, you got it. You got it. And so what happened was that they got all of the analysis after that supported the strategic decision at the beginning that they weren't going to approve the license. And uh, that happened in uh, 05, 06. Uh, well, in, uh, in, in 2011, one of the steam generators, well, no, just last, in, in 2012, rather, uh, a steam generator had just been run for 10 months, and it started to blow tubes. And we've just discovered today that uh, um, over 100 tubes were, com were half-worn or more. And, of course, what, what the, the Fairwinds report that just came out today shows that um, all of the tubes that had to be plugged, there's 1,300 plugs that uh, had to be inserted in those two units. If you look at all the other nuclear reactors, they only needed 300 plugs. So San Onofre has four times more plugs than it than all the other nuclear reactors in the country. So if one of those tubes breaks, there's a, an immediate atmospheric release. Do I have that right? Yes. The, actually, it happened once back in the 90s where one tube broke completely, and it released um, uh, 50,000 gallons of, of uh, nuclear reactor coolant to the, the side of the plant that's supposed to be clean. And the problem with San Onofre is it wouldn't stop at one tube. These things would cascade like popcorn popping. And there's 9,600 of them in each one? Yes, and you could easily have a couple hundred blow had there been, um, you know, a, Good a, a grief. tube. Uh, yeah. Good uh, grief. Russell? Arnie, uh, you've worked with the nuclear industry for 40 years. Uh, you ended up as a v vice president of a nuclear company, and then you came to see that things weren't being implemented properly. But with what you're talking about today in Southern California, is this a deterioration of what, the, you know, what used to be a better situation, or has it always been this way? Um, I, I actually think that at, at least... Um, no, it's always been this way. I think I can. I was kidding myself in the 70s and 80s when I was a senior VP. Mm -hmm. uh, Good man. In the 90s, when I blew the whistle, and you know the NRC deliberately botched the inspection of my concerns, and the NRC was taking bribes from my employer. Uh, it took Senator John Glenn in congressional hearings to exonerate me. And, Damn. and not every whistleblower can get to Senator no. John Glenn for congressional hearings, right. unfortunately. And even then, though, Russ, you know, it convinced me that regulation was right. lax, but right. it didn't make me, right. um, it didn't turn me, I thought nuclear power was a good idea even then. Right. It was Fukushima that, that, that really flipped me completely over. We, and that's because we're talking about, the, the, to use Donald Rumsfeld, right. the unknown unknowns. Right. Mother Nature can always throw something at us that we didn't anticipate. They don't, they don't. They're too arrogant. There's too much hubris to take into consideration chaos theory. Mm -hmm. We've got a caller. Joe, are you still with us? Hey, I can't even tell you how great this discussion is, you guys. Um, I just want to chime in. This, I think this is a, a uh, another shining example of how we have, you know, we're in the information age, but yet the secrecy prevails. And just the political elite, you just you look at the failures left hey, they, they had to use the freedom of information yeah. act to get information out of the department of justice to find out what the interest rate on the goddamn loan mm -hmm. was well there's <laughs> say um sace.org that's s-a-c-e dot org they had to do a freedom of information act uh request just to be able to find out yeah as the you say interest rate. What, what the origination fees were for a loan, as if that's a big proprietary secret that the taxpayers who are funding this shouldn't know. Well, it, but unfortunately it happens at the same time when student loans are higher than what they're charging mm -hmm. these guys, so that as a backdrop starts to become, you know, a vivid oh damn. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the whole, this whole issue is so absurd to me because nuclear power is not economical to begin with. It, it, for new nuclear power, you're talking 24 cents a kilowatt hour of delivered electricity. And energy efficiency is 3 cents a kilowatt hour, eight, one eighth the cost right. of nuclear power. Photovoltaics now have gone below 18 cents per kilowatt hour, and wind is down below 12 cents per kilowatt hour delivered. Right. And so the whole thing is just like it's unneeded, 